Part of the mission of Revival Radio TV is to capture the inspirational stories of these great men of faith. We were blessed to know Jack Coe Jr. and to have him here on the set of Revival Radio TV. We talked about his personal legacy of faith. Jack Coe Jr. shared stories and stories of his father's miracle revival meetings, a unique insight into what really happened. He carried that legacy forward even, following Jesus' great commission to go ye and spread the gospel. Well, he did exactly that all over the world. And even Kenneth Copeland prophesied to him that he would preach to crowds larger than his father's meetings. And that's exactly what happened. Sometimes he had to have up to seven meetings a day to fit everyone into the arena. Today, I want us to look back and share some stories from his life and his father's miracle ministry. Join me now as we take a look back and honor this great man of faith, Jack Coe Jr. He heard them give the altar call and he went running from outside the tent into the tent mm -hmm. to the altar and he didn't know how to pray because how he old, How old was he at this point? Uh, he was in his 20s. Early 20s, okay. Yes. Uh, and he, he didn't know how to pray. And so he started saying, God, I don't know what they've got, but whatever they've got, I got to have what they've got. I love that. I love that. I got to have what they got. And so, he, oh, God, give me what they got. And so as he was praying that way, he said he felt something like, Somebody poured warm oil from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Praise and he started hollering, I got it, I got, got it. it, hot dog, I got it. Hot dog, I got and it. And he got drunk on the spirit, <laughs> went home that night hollering, hot dog, I got it, and opened up the front door. And as my grandmother said to my step-granddad, said, it sounds like Jack's drunk again. Yeah. You better go put him to bed. Uh. And <laughs> so my step-grandfather got up and tried to lay him in the bed and he'd sit up in the middle of the bed hollering, I got it. Hot dog, I got it. Hot dog, I got it. And he was speaking in another language uh, and my granddad said, I, I've never seen him so drunk. said, I can't handle him. The next morning when he got up, he went to the breakfast table and he said, uh, can we pray over the food? Well, they've never prayed over food in that house before. And he started praying over the food and got happy at the breakfast table and started shouting and praising God. Something happened in him. He knew he wanted to thank God for his food the very next morning. Isn't that interesting? When you have a, a revelation of who God is, that got in on the inside of him and he knew he was thankful. Well, that you are when something That's like right. that happens in your life. So it, what happened next? Well... He started to work in it. First, him and my mother started going to church. At, and my mother told him, said, uh, you're going to have to, you know, learn how to do things. And so the pastor told him, first of all, to clean toilets. Well, he didn't feel like he's called to clean toilets. But my mother told him, well, you need to do, learn to whatever right. he says to be obedient. Then the second thing they did is put him over a two-year-old class. Oh uh, he was home c complaining, and she said, well, you learn how to minister to two-year-olds, then you can learn how to minister to others. And then God just began to use him and, and moved on up to uh, other places. Then he felt called to be an evangelist. You know, the, the thing that uh, is, I think, so interesting about your dad, when I look at the old videos and see, uh, in fact, I think Oral Roberts called him... Um, you know, a mighty man of faith, one of the reckless man reckless of faith. Reckless man of faith, that's what it was. Jack Cole preached under big tops larger than the Ringling Brothers to some of the largest tent meetings ever held for revivals in Miami, Pittsburgh, Washington, New York City, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, hundreds of smaller communities. People by the hundreds of thousands turned out at his tent meetings and packed them evening after evening. There were hundreds of other people who came in wheelchairs, pushed along by friends, crutches and wheelchairs left behind by people for whom the prayers of Reverend Cole and the assembled thousands had been answered, accumulated after each meeting. Because in plain language, Jack Cole preached the power of hope and prayer as opposed to the power of fear. Reckless man of faith. And he didn't just do like we see so many people in churches do, go lay hands and go, let's believe God and 
you can take it and you're healed. And no, he would go grab uh, the, if there was a uh, something on the side of their head, he'd go grab it and take it off and move. He was, he had the faith of giants. He, he told me all kinds of miracles that took place. At one time that he was in the tent and they had somebody in a wheelchair and they rolled him up and he picked him up and he was a big man. Yeah, he was. And, and he took the wheelchair with his foot and kicked it out of the way and holding him up and said, run in the name of Jesus. And he let go of them and they fell. Right. He picked them back up and said, I didn't tell you run uh, to fall. I said, run. They began to pray and he let them go again and they fell. Three times that happened. Wow. Well, I, that would have, I would have quit. Yeah. But he picked them up on that fourth time and prayed and hauled off and kicked that man in the seat of the britches with his foot and said, I said, run. And the power of God hit that man and he began to run all over that tent. Wow. So, you know, things like that and he, he it just nothing that seemed like it ever scared him as right. when I was yeah. a little boy. It, uh, I count on anything. He he always had a way of seeing God work, and he just believed God no matter what. Amen. You know we need we need more. Um, I think we need more reckless men of faith. Yes, I uh, had lunch with Oral Roberts. I guess about four months before he died. Right. And uh, he told me he said. Your dad scared me to death. Said I just knew that they was gonna be suing him. Right. And he said I asked your dad one time. Said, how can you all off and hit people like that and break their crutches before you pray for them and, and uh, know that it's gonna happen? He says I just believe God. He said God said to do it, so I've got to be obedient. Wow. He he really wanted to see revival. He did. And he wanted the church to have revival. It seemed like when you look at the news reports, in fact, there's one photo when he was in jail in Florida for preaching or uh, without a license or what was it? Uh, practicing practicing medicine, medicine without, without a, license. a license. And he's just standing there and he's got the biggest smile on his face. He had a, he believed God so much that the harder you came after him, the bigger the miracles got and the more faith he had. The story I was talking about was Miami, Florida. He went, Miami. To, he went to go uh, and he had a healing service there. And take the story from there. What happened? Well, uh, the Church of Christ came against him hmm. and wanted to prove that he, healing was not for today. Isn't it amazing how many people will fight you to believe in healing? They just it's really amazing. Will. It yeah. really is amazing. People don't, don't want to believe it. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And and so they uh, said that they brought a boy through, and he told him to take off the crutches, and uh, he had polio, and so they they had all uh, got all of the story together. In fact, I've got all the articles, and in fact, I just found the transcript right. of that uh, trial, but they had people lying to try to put him in jail and the judge threw it out. Gordon Lindsay, Christ for the Nations, mm -hmm. you know, all of the preachers back in those days came and got together. Instead of fighting one another like they do today and talking bad about each other, preachers worked together back in those days. Right. And I, I like to see people get along, but Amen. there was a power in them coming together and because they all came together, it filled up the courthouse and they threw the the court. Uh, they threw the uh, charges Jason. out. He won, and they they even made him a uh, honorary sheriff of Miami yeah, after the trial. About that. Yeah, pr practicing medicine without a license. In fact, if I remember right, it was there is no law against divine healing. That's right. Right. Help me if I've got this right. A. A. Allen, after your dad passed away, got. He got your dad's tent. He bought my dad's bought tent. Dad's tent and in fact, uh, uh, he bought my dad's tent, and then he got all the chairs. Right. And I've got a chair that went from my dad's tent to A.A. Uh, a. Allen to Shambach, wow. and Donna Shambach gave me a chair the other Praise day. Praise God, that's awesome. And so I've got the original chair. Tell me one of the miracles that stands out to you in your ministry. Tell me one of them. Yeah, well... I had a woman, I didn't know that she got healed until later, 
but her arm was all bent up mm -hmm. and it could not be moved. It stayed like this. And she found my sister like 20 years later and everything was working. That's one of the miracles. Wow, wow. Uh, said it was because of your brother praying for me. I was praying for a deaf person one time. <laughs> You know, sometimes you believe it and sometimes you don't. Sure. It's like my dad told the story one time. He said he had a person in the, his line. And he sent them back to the line to the back seven times. <laughs> and then they got up nobody else was in line. <laughs> and he said, oh, God, what am I going to do now? And God said, you're not the healer anyway. I am. Right. And he prayed and God oh, healed him. In this next clip, you're about to see Jack when he came back to be on the program this past summer. He was strong. He came in with a great passion for the love of God and revival. He prayed for people in the audience as we saw what God was doing in his life. I've never seen Jack stronger than he was that day. Watch this. So take us back to your childhood with your dad. Well, it was, uh, I was a, about 11 when he passed away, but I go back and I remember all the things that took place in those revivals. There would be thousands of people in this big tent. It was the world's largest tent at that time. And my, you'd see miracles. Uh, I, I remember as a little boy seeing my dad he would he would haul off and hit people if they had cancer in their stomach or something, and, and people said he was really brutal. But he said I never did it unless God told me to do it. And uh, then if they had a bad back, he'd put his knee in their back and bend them over backwards. And uh, I mean miracles would take place. I remember one time this woman had this tumor, and he hauled off and hit her in the stomach and. This tumor went down so fast that she lost her skirt. <laughs> and, you know, I, I just remember things like this. And, I would remember that too. Yeah. <laughs> what did he do to prepare for him? Do you, did you know what he did? Do you remember what he well, did? Well, when he went to New York, he had the world's, I would say, largest revival at that time. There was over, they estimated, uh, up to 90,000 people in New York City. Wow. There was more people outside the tent than was in the tent. And he would always rent uh, a, a hotel room and he would be uh, in one room. He'd rent one for the kids and one for him and my mother. But I, I remember, you know, him getting up early in the mornings and praying. And I mean, you could hear him. He'd wake us up in the other room praying. And uh, it wasn't just a soft prayer. It, he, he got boisterous at times and, and made demands on God, said, God, your word, this is what it says. Hmm. And so, you know, that's the thing I think that a lot of us don't do is when we feel something, we, you step out by faith and do it. My dad was just that way. If God told him something, he just believed it was going to happen. And I remember him praying for one woman and you know, or as a, might have been a man. I, I just remember the, the person he prayed for dropped to the ground, and he picked him up and said, "I tell you to drop to the ground. I wanted you to run in the name of Jesus." And he picked him up and prayed again, and that person dropped to the ground again. And he picked him up again the third time. And he prayed, and as he prayed, he hauled off with his shoe and kicked him, her and her, her, him in the rear end and the power of God hit them and they took off running. They ran all over that tent, healed by the power of God. And, and you know, my dad, I, I, we were talking in the room over here about, you know, things that took place in back when and my mother told before I was born that uh, it was back during the war. You had to have some kind of stamp to get gas. I, I don't remember because I yeah. just go by what she tells me. And 
they didn't have the money or the stamp for gas. And dad said, well, I've got a meeting scheduled. I'm, I'm going to keep my word. And he said, God's going to have to get us there. And they got in that car with a gas gauge reading empty and drove all the way to the meeting. And when they got in the front yard of the church, the car sputtered and spit and quit. And then another time she told about how, you know, they had, didn't have good tires. They had Maypops. And, uh, you know, they could hear, the, could tell that the air was going down on the tire. My dad got out, went and laid hands on that tire and prayed for that tire. And that tire came back up and they drove wherever they was going. And it was, I think, she said it was like a month before they could get money to get a tire. So, you know, just things like that would take place. He, if faith was so high in his heart and mind that he just believed God no matter what, it was going to take place. Amen. And, you know, God healed him too of, uh, when he was in the army. They... Uh, gave him a furlough or to, to, to put him out because he was too sick to stay in. And they were supposed to pay him from then on. And he said, I don't want a check from the government. I don't want nothing from the government. And he started going out preaching and praying for people. And, you know, God healed him and made him whole while he was out preaching. So, you know, God can do the outstanding things in our life if we just believe God. That's right. That's right. That's a good word, Jack. Good yeah. word. What What is it that uh, I know people ask you all the time, your whole life, I'm sure, about your dad and everything, but what is it that you want people to really take from his ministry? If they could take one thing from what your dad did and how he heard God, what would it be? If they could get the faith that he had. Faith. Faith is the thing that moved him to do everything. I mean, he, he would go and order a tent, not have the money for the tent. And my mother would say, how are we going to pay for it? He said, God told me to do it. And then miraculously, the money would come in right at the time to pay for it. Uh, I mean, people would send it in or somebody would give him a big check. But miraculously, God moved him. He just had faith. He just believed God. And he listened to God. And... Uh, you know, it just miracle after miracle would take place. Deaf ears would be unstopped. Uh, blind eyes would be open. And I mean, not just one or two, but, but a whole, I would say a thousand or two people. He'd pray for them every night. I went to Philadelphia back in the, uh, I guess it was about the 70s, late 70s, early 80s. And a man came up to me and said, you don't know who I am. And uh, it was at the Met in Philadelphia. And he said, I was here in this building when your daddy came here. And he said the place was packed and it had three balconies. And all three balconies, he said, were full. And the stage would seat over a thousand people. And they had taken all the uh, props off and put chairs out so people could sit to be in the meeting. But he said, your daddy had prayed for probably about 150 people, 200 people. And he said, I was in a wheelchair in line. And he said, I was five people away. And your dad said, I'm so tired. I just got to quit. I've got to stop. And he said, oh, I missed it. I'm not going to get healed. But he said, my dad said, what I'm going to do is take this oil and draw a circle in the floor and everybody that comes through the circle is going to get healed. And he said, they pushed me in the wheelchair through that circle. He said, the power of God hit me and I came out of that wheelchair and I never was in it again. Praise God. And he said, here, he said that's, that's been several years since your daddy was here. Your dad already had passed away. Well, you know, God's miracle working power just doesn't have to be through the man. It's, it can be in, a, in just a man speaking something. When somebody says something, it's going to happen. Uh, Brother Nix is with me today. He, uh, 
you know, had me at his church. And he would preach the sermon before I got there uh, about Elisha being put in a grave and his bones there. And they threw a soldier in on the soldier came alive. So God's power is not just limited to a man laying hands on you. Amen. It's right. it's just believe the words that the, the man of God says and speaks over you and you keep speaking them to yourself and keep telling yourself what God's word said and what the man of God said. See, God, that man believed that if he was rolled through that circle, he was going to get healed. And he got what he believed for. And he said that night there were so many miracles that took place after your daddy left the building. He said, people after people, I saw him come through in wheelchairs, come through on crutches. And he said they'd throw their crutches and leave them behind. Oh, wow. My dad used to hang up ropes in the tent and hang all the wheelchairs all the way across the tent. And crutches, I mean, he had a whole tractor trailer full of people that had been delivered from crutches and wheelchairs and uh, shoes that people's one leg was shorter than the other. And my daddy preached a sermon one time, do it again, Lord, do it again. And I, I'm believing he's going to do it again just like that. And we're going to see signs, Amen. wonders, and miracles, not just a few. I mean, God's never quit doing miracles, but we're, we're not seeing the magnitude of them that we saw back in those days. Uh, A. A. Allen, you know, I remember all of that. Uh, I would go to his meetings as a young boy. But, you know, God is wanting to do it in each one of you today. He's wanting to work through you. And all you've got to do is have the power to believe God for great things to take place in your life. And when you pray for somebody, believe it's going to happen. That's right. And we need to see God move like he's never moved before. The power of God has not changed. He's still on the throne and he still works miracles and signs and wonders and things take place that's out of the ordinary that we can't even believe how it happens. It's just God working in our lives. Amen. Hey, so, Jack, tell him about, we were talking back there about um, Columbia. Tell him about your oh, meetings well, in Columbia. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I got a prophecy sometime back that I would have crowds as big as my dad. In fact, I believe it was Kenneth Copeland that gave yeah, me the prophecy. The word, right? Yeah, I, right. yeah, back uh, a few years ago, and I was here at uh, the meeting, and it's when it's in the little building. Yeah. And uh, you know, he he hauled off and hit me. I, I didn't know he hit me, but my wife said that better have been God because he'll come up from there and hit you back. <laughs> 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 and. Uh, but anyway, uh, she said, he slapped you so hard I could hear it pop all the way back. She was sitting about three rows back. And uh, man, he hit me and gave me the word. And I, I got that tape and I played that prophecy. And I thought, oh, he's missed it like all the others because he said I'd have crowds as large as what my father had. Well, it wasn't but maybe six months later, somebody contacted me to go to Columbia. And when I got to Columbia, I saw my first meeting was probably 5,000. Then I went and preached at another place and it was probably 10,000. And then I went to a church of 20,000. And I had to preach seven times a day at that church because they had such a big crowd that they had, they had to have different times to come in to get the people in. But God has moved over there. It was just like old times. I mean, I'd see people. I couldn't lay hands on everybody like my father did because the crowds were so big. And we didn't have the room that he had in a tent. But uh, people would leave their crutches behind. They'd leave their wheelchairs behind. People testified of cancers being removed, tumors being removed. Uh, marriage is being put back together. And then I go to Norway and uh, God blesses me there in Norway. I, I just talked to a man 
just the other day that's from Norway. I preach in his church because so many miracles took place there in Norway. I mean, in his church, a woman that was bound to a wheelchair for a long time got healed, took, pushed me in a wheelchair around the place, and, uh, you know, he says she's still walking today. So, you know, God don't just do a little bit. God does a whole lot. Amen. And right. he, he's wanting to do work in every one of you. You know, Jack, our, our theme is this little sticker right here. It's called Be the One. And we talk about being the one. You yeah. know, you had to make a decision. I had to make the decision. To go ahead and be open. Mm -hmm. And did you always feel like that was the right thing to do? I knew it was the right thing yeah. to do. It's not, right and I thing. didn't want to do it when yeah. I first started out. But, but you made a decision. But I made a decision. One. I know a friend of ours, Todd White, says uh, people are always talking about feel lead. Just put a piece of lead in your pocket so you can reach in your pocket and feel lead. Yeah, I know, uh, I know Todd. Yeah, yeah, to go out there and witness. And, and this is what it is all about. I mean, you don't have to have the heritage that you came from. No. But you couldn't get to heaven on your dad's ministry either, no, could you? No, I couldn't. You had that. to make, you had to come to that place. I, I had to be <clears> the one. That. that defining moment to be the one, to step out and go, okay, God, I've seen a lot of fakes. I know that you're real. I want the real. And you stepped out. Thank you. Would you pray for the people before we go off the air? I sure would. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, the people that are sick in their body, I speak healing into their body. Jesus. People that are having problems with their salvation. Lord, right now, speak to their heart. Let them know that how much you love them. You died for them. You went to the cross. You paid the price for their healing and their salvation. You paid the price that every good thing that's in your word that you have promised will come to pass. And we ask it done right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, move upon every one of them right now. And Lord, their children that are lost, save their children. You promised us our household. Lord, not just one or two, but the whole household will be saved. And I thank you for it right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. 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 And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jack. I feel grateful to have known this mighty man of God, Jack Coe Jr. Jack never stopped preaching the Word of God and he never stopped walking out the love of God in spite of the many obstacles he faced in his life. I hope this story of Jack Coe's life as we've looked back has been an inspiration to you, just like it's inspired me for us to take this story and live out our own legacy of faith to be the one in our generation.